And I think I will start us off by just saying good afternoon to everyone who's viewing online or in person at the IGF. My name is Christine Strutt. I'm a partner and attorney at Von Seidel's, where my work concerns African intellectual property rights in the digital online space. I'll be moderating this panel on behalf of INTA, which is the International Trademark Association, where I serve on the Internet Committee. In the past few years, colleagues on this committee conducted a survey around the perception of brands among members of Gen Z, given that this generation represents a significant portion of consumers and internet users. And their findings illuminate concerning trends across youth from very different geopolitical locations with respect to their trust on the internet. This panel discussion aims to further unpack those findings and explores the perception and trust of Gen Z in emerging online technologies to consider appropriate regulation that addresses their needs and concerns. With me is David Opija, partner and head of trademarks at Bowman's Kenya. David specializes in intellectual property with a focus on litigation, technology, data privacy, and e-commerce. David is also a member of the INTA Internet Committee. We also have INTA Africa Global Advisory Council member, Pechua Mwangi, who is a partner at the Kenyan law firm, Simba and Simba Advocates, where she heads up the intellectual property division. In addition to being a full practicing advocate, she recently graduated from the Kenyan School of Internet Governance convened by the Kenya ICT Action Network. And lastly, we're joined by Marco Stavro. Marco is the co-founder of Hustlers Global, one of the world's leading Gen Z business communities, and an active speaker, advocate, strategist, and consultant to corporates on matters concerning Gen Z in the workplace. Having already established a successful PR business with full-time employees at age 15. Marco, now aged 18, is the youngest person to ever study at Henley Business School and also the only person on our panel who's able to give us an insider's view of how Gen Z view the world and the internet. I want to thank you all for joining this panel and kick off with a quick snapshot of Gen Z or Zoomers, as they're also referred to. Now, this is the age demographic of people born between the mid 90s and early 2000s, and they're currently aged around seven to 24. They're typically considered to be digitally sophisticated, having grown up with the internet and social media. And to give you an idea of the extent of their comfort zone with technology, a recent study had respondents, all in the Gen Z age group, indicating that technology is a decisive factor when considering employment options. And 91% of them said that they would actually quit a job because of the tech or devices if they are inferior to those that they use at home. Now, Gen Z also highly values trust and authenticity they're environmentally concerned, ethical shoppers, they value sustainability and brand alignment with their personal values. And approximately 97% of Gen Z's surveyed said they learn about new products from social media. About 50% have recently bought something using their mobile phone. And about a third felt that they were still concerned that those projects products were actually counterfeit. So there is a trust for mobile and online shopping, but also some worry in their minds. This generation also values access over possession. So think of ride hailing, car share and streaming services. To them, consumption means having access to products and services rather than owning them. They're conscious of racial, sexual, religious, and neurodiversity and inclusiveness, 
highly value individual expression in terms of style and how they present themselves online and in real life. They're financially minded and social media activists that are politically progressive. By 2025, they will make up almost 30% of the global workforce and account for 40% of consumers. It would therefore be sensible that the traits and concerns of Gen Z should be factored into ongoing IGF discussions on creating a safe online environment with the advancement of technologies. Perpetua, would you mind telling us something about the types of new and emerging technologies that will have the biggest impact on this generation of digital natives? Um, thank you, Christine, um, and even for our participants um, this evening. So um, having um, had that background about the Gen Zs and the study that was conducted, so the question posed is that what are the emerging online technologies? There's a, a buzzword in the internet space, so to speak, which I'm sure is not, um, these words are not strange to you who are here. Um, so the metaverse, what is the metaverse? So met the metaverse has been broadly defined as a virtual world where people can live, people can work, people can travel, people can play. Um, in some circles, it's been defined as a social utopia. Um, in other circles, it's um, so-called a virtual economy where the trade of goods and services can actually take place. There have been words such as a virtual reality or augmented reality. Um, another emerging technology, obviously, another buzzword is artificial in intelligence, which um, broadly defined, again, is a simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer uh, systems. Um, almost all businesses today actually employ some form of um, artificial intelligence. AI can play chess. AI, AI can um, solve complex mathematical sol um, problems. Um, AI can recognize voice and, and, and handwriting. Um, so AI is also used in a diverse area of fields such as um, medicine, um, um, uh, education, and of course, um, uh, of concern to us um, as INTA is uh, legal uh, in the justice system. There's a lot of AI that is used there. AI um, has raised concerns which um, forms the bulk of our discussion this evening, ethical concerns, legal concerns, um, and especially intellectual property rights. How do they um, fit into these discussions? Um, the other emerging technology that is popular among Gen Zs is um, the blockchain. Um, so blockchain again has been broadly defined as a collection of records linked with each other, so-called distributed ledger. Um, it's, I read an article recently that um, um, stated that um, Walmart actually has used the blockchain, um, blockchain technology to provide customers with better services. So what used to happen is that um, Walmart was facing a high return rate of goods and huge amounts of refunds. And um, because of that, they were in, unable to de de determine what is the point of failure in their distribution system. So Walmart used the blockchain technology to ascertain um, the levels at which there was a gap. So they did, um, they, they permanently inscribed within a block. Um, so using the blockchain technology and the quality of goods in each step, they're able to ascertain that and uh, to that extent, they are able to identify the problem and, and fix the same. Um, another emerging technology that we, um, are, we, we have the view that is popular among the Gen Zs is the NFTs uh, or non-fungible tokens. Um, so what are NFTs? Broadly defined is a, a digital asset that um, exists on the blockchain and whose value is decided by our community. So from an intellectual property perspective, um, NFTs that are minted, the digital assets, can be protected by copyright. The name of the NFT can be protected by trademarks. And of course, the underlying um, technologies um, part, uh, enjoys patent protection. Um, the other uh, emerging technology um, is IoT, or Internet of Things. Um, our everyday life is basically um, integrated with the internet. Our cars, um, simple household machines that people use at home, including toothbrush, apparently is connected to the internet. 
The last um, emerging technology that we'll talk, uh, talk about is uh, 3D printing. So 3D printing is defined as the uh, you know, creation of um, three-dimensional objects using computer-created designs, where designers use 3D printers to quickly create product, um, product models and prototypes. And now, as the technology continues to grow, it's being used to um, make final products. Um, those in brief remarks are the emerging technologies that have an impact on the Gen Z's um, or Gen Z's, depending on where you come from. That certainly gives us an idea of landscape and the environment that someone in the Gen Z age group would be comfortable with. But David, what are the characteristics of these emerging technologies that concern or appeal to Gen Z? Thank you very much, uh, Christine, for asking that question. Uh, Roberta Kaz, a Stanford scholar, has stated that Gen Zers are highly collaborative people. Uh, therefore, collaboration, being able to collaborate, is one characteristic uh, of these emerging technologies that appeal greatly to the Gen Zers. Secondly, uh, another characteristic is the ability to achieve things at a faster rate. My colleague has mentioned uh, the 3D printing, which is uh, one of the emerging technologies that can be used to create uh, goods at, 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 a high, at a faster rate and on a bigger scale. Turning now to the inter-survey uh, that uh, Christine had, had mentioned earlier regarding Gen Zers and brand restrictions, one issue that emerged from that survey was the issue of trust. The Gen Zers, how do they trust the technologies that are there? We see that these emerging technologies uh, that my colleague uh, Perpetua has highlighted, uh, such as blockchain, NFTs, uh, the ability to uh, use uh, smart contracts. Uh, these are things that can be used to verify authenticity and chain of title. And th these would relate particularly to counterfeit and online goods. So this is a good thing. And this would help to address the trust issue that the Gen Zers have. Turning now to privacy concerns of, of the Gen Zers, again, following up on the inter-survey on, on Gen Zers and brand restrictions, we see that one of the issues that uh, came out of that survey was the issue of uh, concerns about privacy uh, when they are shopping online. We see that the emerging technologies, uh, the ability of uh, depersonalized or anonymous online presence, for example, by way of uh, avatar or otherwise, this can help to bolster uh, privacy concerns of, of among the Gen Zers. And then uh, personalization of, of products, uh, for instance, through 3D printing uh, and design tools, as well as uh, availability and affordability of virtual goods, such as avatar clothing and furniture for virtual space. These are characteristics of these emerging technologies that would appeal greatly uh, or are of concern to the Gen Zers. Uh, so I'll, I'll rest uh, my presentation there, and then we can move to the, to the next question. Thank you. Thanks, David. Marco, if I could turn to you as the only Gen Z on the panel and a consultant in this field, how do these views and perceptions align with your professional work and also your personal experience? Absolutely. I think everything that's been said is totally correct and very forward thinking and many organizations have realized the necessity to implement a lot of these things and me being 18 years old, I got my first laptop and iPad at 13. Many people aged 12 and 13 now have totally grown up with the internet. And so there's almost an expectation around uh, moving into, you know, an institution where they're working, where they expect government agencies, they expect everything to be online. They expect it to, it to work effectively. 
And so I really believe that a lot of this technology that's being now implemented, like Gen Z, are so effective on it because they've grown up with it. So it's no longer a lot of the training when it comes to technology, you've almost skipped over that. And now it's actually more about how do we integrate leadership qualities and EQ and SQ skills into these young people with the technology. And so things like NFTs and blockchain, you know, it's great for young people to be aware of these and for organizations to implement it. But how do we really as young people uh, integrate both sides? It's great to have the technology aspect, but the, actually the people's aspect and putting it into an organization together. And that's the big challenge when I'm working with a lot of companies is that young people have got all these internet skills but are not executing in an effective manner when it comes to actually client work and operational work. And I think that's the challenge that a lot of organizations are facing. I find it fascinating that you refer to the fact that they expect certain things to be online and digital and there is no other option and yet also have some reservations with those technologies and to what extent they trust them. Um, Papitra, if I can call you back, what are the areas of internet governance that you think could influence Gen Z's perception and use of these technologies? And do you think intellectual property has a role in creating a sense of trust in innovation? Um, thank you, Christine. And indeed, it was wonderful to hear from uh, Marco So our participation in the IGF forum. Um, of course, the, some of the key issues that have uh, arisen um, as far as internet governance is concerned is like the lack of digital literacy. And I think these are problems that especially affect the, the global south. So if you don't have um, literacy, I mean, how are you going to be able to access the so-called emerging technologies? Also, another issue that has been recurring is the lack of internet access. So, I mean, that these are issues, again, that are peculiar to the global south. So, um, access, we there are slow speeds, um, cost of connectivity is quite high. Internet shutdown is another issue that has um, come, come up. Um, biased al algorithms, we've had that from very many discussions um, on um, artificial intelligence. Um, limited enforcement structures, uh, privacy concerns, of course, these are key issues within this space. But of great concern to us as um, INT members, um, um, IP professionals, intellectual property rights. And you asked a very uh, interesting question because so how can IP be used in this emerging technologies or how does IP um, find its way in um, these emerging technologies? So um, I'm going to single out some of the emerging technologies that um, we've already highlighted. Um, the first one being the blockchain technology. So um, Gen Z's actually, um, and those who have the benefit of um, enjoying um, the, the benefits that it, um, it offers, can register their intellectual property works to a blockchain. And authors will be assured of a temper-proof evidence of ownership. I mean, um, concept of ownership, of course, is um, quite an issue as far as copyright protection is concerned. Um, um, one of the characteristics, again, of a blockchain is that the, the transactions are immutable. That is that a work, once a work has been registered um, on the blockchain, that information cannot be lost or um, cannot be changed. So other third parties are able to use the blockchain to see the complete chain of ownership of our work, um, they're able to see what licenses have been issued, what sub-licenses have been issued, whether there has been any assignments of um, creative works or IP works. So currently, uh, in the current internet space, what happens is once you have uploaded your work on the internet, um, it becomes extremely difficult to maintain control. You know, once it's in the internet, anyone is free to access the same and you, it's quite difficult to monitor who is using it and for what purposes. Unlike in the blockchain um, space where you're able to track that. So um, the CEO of a platform called Block, Block High, Nathan Lands, said that the blockchain is a perfect solution for providing proof of creation because it's a permanent immutable record, meaning that once the record is there, it is there forever and will never change. Such powerful words coming um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, the perfect solution to an IP problem. 
Um, the other issue that I can talk about um, is uh, the metaverse. Um, not an issue, actually, an emerging technology, the metaverse. So um, use of trademarks in the virtual reality without permission risks, of course, issues of trademark infringement. And um, I wonder if the Gen Zs are concerned about intellectual property issues. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that we are thinking about is the doctrine of fair use, where bra you see brand owners or IP owners are more concerned about a strong recognition of intellectual property rights. But Gen Zs, from the study we had, are more concerned about can I be able to fairly access um, intellectual property rights um, to advance creativity, to, un to advance the concept of individualism, which we've seen is something quite big among the, the Gen Zs. Um, the other thing that, um, of, of an IP perspective, um, take down measures. So these emerging technologies, do they have in place quick take down um, procedures when there are issues of um, online infringement? Um, or um, uh, intellectual property rights infringement. So Gen Zs would be concerned about a quick solution to disputes. We've heard that the Gen Zs are more concerned about quick solutions. So we need um, the emerging technologies to think about having a rapid way or a quick way of um, um, solving um, potential uh, internet-related um, disputes. The last emerging technology that I can touch on is um, an authorized, I mean, 3D printing. Um, from the study, we had that, um, you know, Gen Z's have this concept of individualism. They also want to, you know, feel that sense of uniqueness. But here comes a technology that allows mass production of goods. So for instance, if the design is based on a counterfeit product, that means then you have more mass production of counterfeit goods, meaning that the um, Gen, Z, um, Gen Z's will have access to that. So it already sort of goes against the, the concept of trust that we've, we've had from the studies quite important to the Gen Z's. I think, Christine, those are some of the few issues that I can touch on um, as we continue with these discussions. Great. I, I'm conscious of time. So, David, I just want to ask you if you can briefly, in, in two minutes, just name a few laws or regulations that you think can be crafted or refined to address some of these impacts that these new technologies might have and how can we use existing laws to kind of shape a, a better internet that um, is suitable to the users? Thank you, Christine, uh, for asking that question. Uh, and it ties into what uh, my colleague uh, Perpetua has been um, uh, talking about. Uh, one of the things would be to address uh, policies that would be uh, geared at addressing digital literacy, particularly in the global south, and uh, policies to build accessibility to um, the internet, again, uh, this is more the case in the global south. Uh, building infrastructure, connectivity, etc., etc. Now, I'm very pleased to have Marco also on 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 on, on today on Zoom. Uh, Marco is a young Genza and he's an entrepreneur, and. One of the things that uh, policies should target would be to have regulations that would spur innovation. For example, having regulations and policies that can help uh, the Genzas have access to uh, sandboxes, regulatory labs, and private-public partnerships. And this would be geared at enabling testing of digital business models in experimental environments, and those relate to blockchain, IoT, and AI. Again, it is important to have policies uh, that would target or regulations that would look at how to govern these technologies. Uh, because there can be instances where these technologies are abused or misused. For example, 3D printing being used to create goods that are counterfeit or infringing to the intellectual property rights of, of other people. Again, uh, there, there is a need to have 
uh, policies. Uh, governments should uh, uh, be able to set up task forces to look into how these emerging technologies can be used specifically to protection of brands. And I, I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, trademarks, uh, trademark protection, uh, whereby uh, blockchain technology could be deployed, for example, at the various stages, stages in the life cycle of trademark registration, licensing of trademarks, assignment of trademarks, and use of these technologies being deployed even to combat counterfeiting. Because the inter survey showed that genders are very much aware of counterfeit goods being put out there in, in, in the current platforms. And if these uh, policies could be developed, they could help in uh, curbing this, uh, this menace of counterfeiting. So in a nutshell, what we are saying is that uh, the emerging technologies are good and good for the genders, but there ought to be regulation. There ought to be uh, mechanisms in which they are regulated to spy innovation on the one hand, and on the other hand, to again help to prevent infringement or abuse of the technologies. Thank you. Thanks. I I think that tension is something that Laurie has also commented on in the chat um, and that we'll be continually struggling with. Um, Marco, I want to end off the session with your thoughts on how we design the perfect internet for a new generation. Uh, do you agree that internet governance and specifically intellectual property rights can be impactful in this regard? And are Zoomers more likely to trust government or private practice, or even technological measures to ensure authenticity and trust in online services and related products? I think we've got you on mute there. Did you have to move to someone else? Ah, there we go. I think your mic is working. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Ah, oh, technology. Even as a Gen Z person, now it wasn't working, and I'm, I'm so frustrated. My freeze, my screen freeze. Um, but uh, sorry, do you mind repeating the question quickly? No problem. Um. We want to know how do we design the perfect internet for Gen Z? Um, yes. Does intellectual property help this at all? And are they more likely to trust government regulation, private practice, or technological measures to ensure that there's authenticity and trust in the online space? So I think a great stat to start with is from Gen HQ, which is an American organization, and they did a stat post-COVID with over a thousand Gen Z applicants that that finished the, the research paper. And they showed that the, the organization that Gen Z most trusts is healthcare workers and law enforcement. And they least trust federal and state governments, which is quite a concern when a government is trying to lead a country um, and lead a population of people to do certain things. But from a IP side of things and from a regulations point of side, from a law and you know that, that can be really really helpful and so i think young people have an understanding that there has to be regulation that they have to do things a certain way and a lot of young people have actually lost a lot of money um and lost their businesses because they haven't put the right things in place and so for me that is a concerning stat but it also indicates how organizations can move towards building trust the next question is how do we actually build trust and 47% of Gen Z are more likely to pay for a product or service if they favored influencer using it. So I give an example in a South African context of a Gary Player, who's a very famous golfer, and he has a massive influence in South Africa. And whenever he's in the States and he's playing a tournament, 
uh, and he promotes a golf product, young South African golfers are much more likely to both trust and to purchase. And so as organizations, whether you're an IP firm or you're a consulting company, how do you integrate influential people into what you're trying to solve, into the problem you're trying to solve, so that young people can further trust your organization? So I think that would be a great uh, tip to add. Interesting concept, having a lawmaker and regulator influences. I haven't yeah. thought of that before. Uh, I want to just check with the organizers um, if we have any time for questions in the chat, or if we don't, then I'm happy to wrap up. And I'm uh, sure any of the speakers would be happy to answer questions or have further discussions, either through email or LinkedIn or any other social channels. I think there's also a slide with Laurie's contact details. If anyone is interested in accessing the survey results or any of those findings. Um, Christine, I think we can take two or three more minutes um, and, and probably get a, a, a feeling from um, the, the, the participants, both online and um, um, physical, physically here. Um, so I think that's, that's okay. So I don't know if... Um, I can check through the room and see if there's anyone who has a question or a comment. Please do. So I've got one comment um, here in the chat online while you search for an in-person question. Um, Shay asks, what does the future hold if Gen Z will be too much dependent on online technologies? Is there a world where they're too dependent on these new technologies? It sounds like a question for you, Marco. Sure, I think this is a massive, a great question, a great point. And one of the reasons I believe that a lot of mental conditions and things like depression, anxiety are so high right now is the lack of in-person factors that are just psychologically proven to help a human being. And these may be purpose, community, things that technology cannot buy. And so being outside, running, exercising, being in a school community is so, so important. And so what we saw even with COVID, with online classes, students did not perform better in many regards, and their health deteriorated, their mental health deteriorated in, in an incredible way. And so I think it's massively important that as even in a parenting regard, how do we the average American young kid spends eight and a half hours on their cell phone. So if they're spending eight and a half hours on, on their cell phone, what does that mean for their capacity, both in an emotional and a physical manner? And I think that's a very important point to consider. Absolutely. Papitua, is there anyone in the audience who's raising a hand? I've got no more comments in the yes. online forum. Yes, yes, we have someone and they're ready to talk. Uh, hi, um, I was so it was mentioned several uh, characteristics of the Gen Z, and uh, I was wondering, thinking of the trends from like how the the perceptions and the interests and values change from previous generations to the Gen Z, I was wondering if this trend is more or less the same all over the globe, or if there is an assessment that. Uh, it depends on different regions. So basically, if the characteristics of Gen Z is more or less the same all over the world. Again, I think Marco might have a comment, but so might you, Yes, I yes. Uh, covered quite a few countries. Christine, if, if, I, if I could uh, uh, briefly comment on that question, uh, because we uh, specifically highlighted the a survey, the study that was conducted by INTA, and this survey was limited to 10 countries. We do not have a survey that considered all the countries, so we do not have that kind of data, and we may not be able to comment uh, at a global level. However, this survey took into consideration different factors because some of these jurisdictions were in the global north, and some in the global south at different levels of development. I, I, I hope that has uh, answered your question. Thank you, sir. Does anyone else have, have thoughts about 
whether the characteristics are uniform or whether they are different between different cultures and economic groups. So I, I just wanted to add, there's, there's also a lot of people think that the difference between Gen Z and Gen X is their age. And yet that's one point, but a, a more even important point is the de generational defining moments. And one of the, the example of this would be 9-11. And so obviously the American children whose parents experienced that same as the 2008 crash, it affected different countries and populations in different ways. And so that then is their generation of finding moment for Gen Z and is one of the reasons why these young people believe that they need to get financial independence and, and support their parents. And so I, I think that a world event like 9-11 has a, a similar effect all over the world. It's, it's talked about in South Africa in, in homes. And so I think that's something to also consider is what events happened in your specific country and put those into play when it comes to both influencing and considering Gen Z's perspective. Completely. And I think some of those defining events can also be related to IP infringements or um, big scandals and news stories that relate to technology. And we've had a very eventful time in the tech space these last few weeks that surely would also have an impact on a, a generation of sorts. Um, I have one last question um, from Richard. It says, what is your take on the recent moratorium on proof of work crypto mining by the state of New York? Wouldn't this stifle the growth and development of Web3 and tech in general? Thank you. Um, as none of us are US attorneys except for Lori, I am not sure that we're able to answer this question. And it's maybe one that we might have to revert back to in writing. <laughs> Laurie, I'm not sure if you are keen to offer an opinion on this one. Right. I, I, my name is Laurie Shulman, by the way. I am Senior Director for Internet Policy for INTA, and I am the staff liaison to INTA's Internet Committee. And I take your question to heart about what's going on in New York, New York State jurisdiction. It's even um, a state issue rather than a um, federal issue. And um, I will say this, uh, I would like to revert back to you in writing if you could put your question into the chat. And while we're looking at emerging laws in terms of the emerging technologies, I'm not sure. I think, I think there's, it we're too early on. Um, what had happened in the past weeks with crypt, uh, particular cryptocurrency will definitely have impacts. Um, state laws are being envisioned and enacted um, in order to um, respond to a need that perhaps the U.S. federal government has not caught up with yet. So um, rather than give sort of an off-the-hip type of response, I'm very happy to provide a more considered response. And, and um, thank you, Richard, for that. In the chat, I will get back to you. Um, I will put my email here. Yes, you've got so a final slide with your email. And I think I'm going to yeah. end off there. Um, just closing remarks about Gen Z and internet governance. It seems that there's a lot of tech, there's a lot of uncharted territory, but there's also a need to maintain purpose and a human element um, in how we nurture this new generation and the use of technology uh, to make a better world. Thank you again to all the panelists and to everyone who joined us uh, to hear these insights. I thoroughly enjoyed discussing this topic with you and I look forward to exploring it further in the years to come. Thanks gonna, very much. Thank you. I'm just gonna intervene very quickly. Please email me. There's been asks for the presentation. There's been asked for the study. I've put, there's actually two studies involved in this. There's one on counterfeits and one on brand restrictions. I was able to put the link in for counterfeits. We don't have the time for me to find the link to drop in brand restrictions, but I'm happy to send all materials to anyone who asks for them. Great, we've run out of time. I see there's one more person on the floor, um, but I understand that the session was only 30 minutes and we've gone well over time. So unfortunately, as the moderator, I'm going to have to end off the session.
Perhaps you can have a further discussion in person with Chua and David. Um, I'll leave it the floor to you. Uh, sure thing. Thank you, Christine. And I, um, it's been a wonderful session. We'll continue the discussions um, offline. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Um, so thank you for joining us. We are happy to engage um, offline. <laughs> thank you.